Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Fight Colorectal Cancer webinar. We are um, just getting started for the day, so thank you for, uh, for joining live. And for those of you watching um, after the recording, um, thank you for watching. Uh, my name is Sharon Worrell. I'm the Senior Manager of Education here at Fight CRC. And let's get started. So today we are going to be talking about, uh, this is our post ASCO 2020 webinar. Um, things were a little different this year as the, the conference was hosted virtual instead of in person, but that doesn't mean that there's not great uh, research to share. So we, a, a little bit of background about the webinar. Um, we will be doing a question and answer at the end of the session. So please type in your questions um, on the panel on the right side of your screen and we will get to those at the end of the webinar. Um, as you know, the webinar is archived. It lives on the Fight CRC website. So in a couple hours, you can visit fightcrc.org and search for it there. If you did register for the webinar, you will be getting an email tomorrow with the direct link to the session. As always, please tweet along. You can follow us on Twitter and use the hashtag CRCWebinar. Fight CRC has a wide variety of resources for everyone touched by colorectal cancer. Again, visit fightcrc.org to view, download, and order our latest resources. We do have our new Wellness Wednesday series that's live streaming on Facebook at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, we also have Your Guide in the Fight, uh, which is our flagship resource geared for stage three and four colorectal cancer patients. And of course, our ongoing blog series right now having a, a number of resources related specifically to COVID and colorectal cancer. Um, and if you visit our website, there's information about a town hall that we are hosting um, in just a couple days on Thursday. Um, you can find the information online and on Facebook. Please join us um, on Thursday evening. The information and services provided by Fight Colorectal Cancer are for general informational purposes only. The information and services are not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. If you are ill or suspect that you are ill, please see a doctor immediately. In an emergency, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Fight CRC never recommends or endorses any specific physicians, products, or treatments for any condition. And with that, we are super excited today to have uh, Dr. Goldberg joining us today. He's an international leader in the GI cancer treatment and research area, um, has been doing this work for a very long time. Um, and we're thrilled to have him as you know, both a, a advisor to fight CRC um, and also just a really great resource for us. And he is here to talk to all of you today about um, the, the great news coming out of ASCO. So Dr. Goldberg, I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand it over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm sitting in uh, West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, in my study overlooking uh, the Cheat uh, River, uh, so beautiful West Virginia. Uh, I hope you have a, a beautiful day as well. Uh, I'm gonna update you on what happened at our virtual meeting of ASCO this year. Uh, and uh, we all missed seeing each other, uh, unfortunately, uh, but uh, we did uh, have a, a number of important presentations uh, that we saw uh, on screen as well. Uh, so I'm going to start out talking to you about advanced colorectal cancer. Uh, so this is uh, colorectal cancer that's spread from the colon to other organs. And we talk about lines of treatment uh, in this area. Uh, so first line treatment is the initial treatment for somebody who has newly diagnosed disease and has never been treated uh, with chemotherapy for advanced disease before. Uh, and now we also have a number of drugs available for treatment of colorectal cancer, some new at this year's ASCO meeting, uh, so that uh, individuals uh, can be treated with a number of lines of therapy. Uh, you'll notice uh, that many of the studies that I'm going to present to you have cute little names like Keynote or Panda or Beacon or Destiny, uh, which helps us remember the studies uh, better than if they just had a number. So I'm going to start with two studies uh, in first line. 
<clears throat> one is an immunotherapy study, which is really practice changing, uh, called the Keynote 177 study. And then the other is a study using uh, a, a drug called panatumumab or Vectabix with chemotherapy in the elderly. Uh, and then for later lines, we'll talk about some subsets of colorectal cancer. Uh, so the first study uh, is called pembrolizumab, which is one of the new immunotherapy PD-1 inhibitors uh, versus chemotherapy in patients with what we call microsatellite instability. Uh, and let me explain that a little bit to you. So uh, we used to think that all colorectal cancers were the same. But as we've understood them better, we realized that uh, there are all kinds of different subsets of colorectal cancer. Uh, and at the top of the list, we divide them into two groups, one where uh, the colon cancer is a result of what we call chromosomal instability. That means that there are mutations occurring in chromosomes that uh, permit the colon cancer to develop. Uh, that's about 85% of colorectal cancers. The second main subset are tumors that are caused by what we call microsatellite instability. We call them microsatellite instability high tumors. And this is about 15% of all colorectal cancers, but this group of patients uh, whose tumors develop along this pathway actually tend to have better outcomes with early disease. And as a consequence of that, while it's 15% of all colorectal cancers, only about 5% of the people with advanced disease have this finding in their tumors. <clears throat> the best way to explain this is that it's like having a defective spell check uh, as your DNA is dividing. So you remember DNA is a double helix. It unzips uh, in order for cells to divide. As a process of the unzipping, sometimes there are errors in the way that the new uh, DNA strand that uh, is required uh, to build the helix uh, is formed. And uh, there are some patients whose tumors have uh, this defective spell check. In some cases, every cell in a person's body has this defective spell check, and those patients have what is called Lynch syndrome. Uh, in other cases, this defective spell check happens as we age. And we now are recommending that all colorectal cancers should be tested uh, for this defective spell check for a number of reasons. One is because it matters with regard to treatment choices. And two is if it turns out that uh, a patient has Lynch syndrome, then we can manage their relatives uh, by determining uh, which ha have this uh, cancer predisposition syndrome and which don't. It's about 50-50 for uh, offspring and siblings. Uh, and uh, manage them with specific preventive measures. Uh, so the Keynote 177 study was a study just in these patients, the 5% of advanced disease patients who have this defective spell check. And the thing that was new about this study, we know pembrolizumab has worked for later lines of therapy but it had never been tested against chemotherapy for first-line therapy. So this is that test. Uh, and it's a uh, study which had 307 patients, half of whom got uh, the immunotherapy drug pembrolizumab, and the other half got uh, any of a number of standard chemotherapies uh, at the choice of the patient and their doctor. And then once patients had shown evidence that the first intervention that they got, whether it was pembrolizumab or the chemotherapy wasn't working, those who initially got chemotherapy could then get pembrolizumab. Uh, and the reason that that's important is that uh, because they had access to pembrolizumab, that influences the overall survival information. Uh, from the study. And you can see it, uh, under the red arrow that a third of the patients who initially started with chemotherapy went on to get uh, pembrolizumab uh, later on. <clears throat>
So if you've never seen these curves, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining what these curves are uh, because they're important to all of the other presentations I'm going to give you. So on the left side of this, uh, it says percent of patients who have progression-free survival. Uh, and what that means is the percent of patients whose tumors have not gotten worse. So ideally, we would like this curve to be a straight line that went from left to right at 100%, meaning that we cured every patient with advanced disease and none of them had progression of their tumors. But what you see on the bottom of this curve is time and months. And so as time goes on, even if the treatment works initially, it stops working over time in some patients. Now, one of the e interesting distinctions about immunotherapy is that we do often see uh, a flat line. Uh, and here you can see in the green curve that this line flattens out at about 40% uh, of patients. So many patients who were on the study had not had progression. And for the first time, really, we're seeing a high percentage of patients uh, uh, who are cured by uh, medical therapy, uh, even with advanced disease. Now, I do want to point out to you that the black graph, uh, black line on the graph is the chemotherapy curve, and this looks very typical of chemotherapy curves. And what I mean by that is about half of the patients will uh, have their tumors get worse by about a year. Uh, and uh, most of the patients, except for about 10%, will have progression uh, at four or five years. And that's what this curve shows. What the green curve shows is, uh, first of all, that it flattens at about 45%. You can also see uh, on the right-hand side where it says median, that the uh, average patient on the pembrolizumab had 16 and a half months of time before their tumor got worse, while that on the chemotherapy curve had about eight months. And again, that eight month number is typical for chemotherapy in this stage four setting. The other thing I wanna bring your attention to is the fact that the green curve initially does a little worse than the black curve, and then it crosses. And this is an unusual phenomenon for uh, studies like this. Uh, there has been this suggestion that a few patients who get immunotherapy turn out to be rapid progressors. Uh, and that's what this curve uh, suggests, is that uh, a few patients uh, had uh, rather rapid uh, problems uh, and their disease got worse quickly. Now, here you can see the overall response rate, which is what ORR stands for. And the response rate for the pembrolizumab patients was about 44% compared to the chemotherapy patients at about 30%. And you can also see that there were more complete responses, 11%, uh, the number in parentheses, versus 3.9% uh, for the chemotherapy group. Uh, how long the responses last also matters, of course. The green curve, again, applies to the pembrolizumab patients getting the immunotherapy. And you can see that uh, about 80% of patients uh, still uh, didn't have progression of their disease in two years, while 65% uh, of the patients on chemo had progressed by that time point. Uh, and again, you see the flattening of the curve uh, at a high level, uh, which is uh, good news for this treatment. Now, the other question is, what are the costs of this treatment in terms of side effects? Uh, and actually, grade three side effects are relatively severe side effects. So for instance, for diarrhea, that would mean uh, six or more stools per day. Uh, and you can see on the left-hand side for pembrolizumab, only a few patients had severe side effects uh, that are typically associated with chemotherapy. And on the right uh, red box, you see the higher numbers of severe side effects uh, for the chemotherapy patients here. Now, immune uh, 
treatments cause their own specific types of side effects, um, usually some sort of inflammation. You can see here the colitis and hepatitis and pancreatitis uh, inside the red bar are several of the uh, side effects that can be caused. And this is actually because we're boosting the immune system uh, so efficiently that in some cases it attacks healthy tissues in these patients. But fortunately, uh, in general, when you stop the drug, these uh, side effects go away. These side effects, as you can see, are not typically associated with uh, chemotherapy. So what are the summaries and conclusions of this study? Uh, the pembrolizumab for this subset, the 5% of patients with advanced disease who have this microsatellite instability high uh, subset of tumors, I uh, really benefited from this treatment. And it is clear that uh, I, the response rates, the duration of response, and the number of patients who had uh, complete responses and had not progressed is much higher with this approach. So this is really a practice changing uh, study. Uh, and this should become the new standard of care as first line therapy for this group of patients. It's not yet been looked at by the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the US, uh, but we're all expecting that this will come for uh, to rapid approval. Now the next study uh, is for a subset of patients, just the elderly. Uh, and uh, elderly patients here are defined as two subsets, those over 70 and those over 75. And what this study was looking at was uh, two drug chemotherapy, 5-FU and oxaliplatin, with a targeted agent called panitumumab versus one drug plus panitumumab, just the 5-FU, uh, and it's called the PANDA study. So here you see this is not a phase three study, but a smaller phase two study with about uh, 90 patients on each arm. Uh, there were uh, two groups of patients. Uh, one is uh, patients uh, older seven than 75 and the other uh, patients between 70 and 75. And the treatment they were given was 5-FU plus panitumumab in the blue bars, uh, plus oxaliplatin, and the red bars just uh, with 5-FU. Uh, and they accepted patients who were sick from their cancers if they were 70 to 75 years, uh, but wanted a better group if they were 75 years or older. Now here you see the results and you can appreciate on this curve, which is again a progression-free survival curve, that means the time it took for the cancers to look worse on scans. You can see this curve is much steeper than the last curve we looked at. Uh, and that's because uh, this treatment is not as effective as the panitumumab was. Uh, but you can see that the curves are pretty much overlapping. The 5-FU uh, plus panitumumab curve is the red one, and the 5-FU oxaliplatin panitumumab curve is the blue one. You can see that the average patient uh, only had a couple of weeks difference in the time it took for their tumors to get worse if they got uh, two drugs versus three. Uh, and the overall response rates were very similar with a disease control rate, meaning the patients who had responses as well as stable disease being essentially the same uh, for two versus three drugs. And the side effect profile for the two drug program for severe side effects was much milder, something that's really important in older patients, particularly those that have other illnesses that they have to contend with in addition to their cancer. So what the study essentially showed was that uh, two drugs uh, is a reasonable choice without a sacrifice of uh, uh, response rate or uh, overall survival uh, in this group of older patients. And uh, this allows us to treat patients uh, without uh, as many side effects, but with uh, still uh, good uh, improvement in their outcomes uh, on the basis of this treatment. And just to show you that there have been some other studies, this is bevacizumab plus capecitabine. Capecitabine is an oral form of 5-FU, so it's essentially a two-drug program using, instead of a, a panitumumab, which is a 
drug that targets the epidermal growth factor receptor using bevacizumab, which is an anti-angiogenic drug. Uh, and it, uh, that approach got about the same outcome as the two-drug regimen with panitumumab. Now, another practice-changing study is uh, this one called the Beacon study. Uh, and this is a study for the subset of patients, uh, these who have in the chromosomal instability pathway, so not the MSI high patients, who have a particularly virulent form of cancer because they have what's called a BRAF600D mutation. And I'm not gonna spend time trying to explain it, uh, uh, just to say that this is a subgroup of colon cancer patients with a particularly poor outcome. And what this study is looking at is uh, patients who've had first and or second line therapy, uh, whose tumors express this mutation, and they were treated with standard therapy, which is chemotherapy plus cetuximab, or with uh, a two-drug program, cetuximab uh, and encarafenib, which is a MEK inhibitor, or cetuximab and bimetinib and encarafenib. So it's essentially a, a two-drug versus a three-drug targeted program. And here again, you see uh, uh, the survival curves for these patients. And you can see that the black curve is the standard therapy, which is chemo plus cetuximab. The blue curve here is the three uh, targeted drugs, and the red curve here is the two targeted drugs. And you can see that the three drug and the two drug programs look about the same with uh, a one year survival uh, that's uh, pretty close, uh, and a median survival of nine versus 8.4 months, which is pretty similar. Here you can see the time it took for the tumors to get worse, and again, the, the uh, targeted therapy uh, arms look very similar to each other. Uh, here is a combination of those two arms uh, superimposed, the red and the blue, uh, meaning the three drug versus the two drug. And you can see that the curves are essentially superimposable with uh, a median overall survival of about nine months for both groups of patients. Uh, and the uh, Serious adverse events were less in the two drug versus three drug group as expected. Uh, this shows that there were very few grade three side effects uh, and fewer in the two drug versus the three drug program. So the bottom line is the uh, blue box down here, which is encarafenib in combination with cetuximab is now FDA approved for use in patients with previously treated uh, tumors that have BRAF600E mutations uh, and should be the new standard of care in these patients. There actually is a study bringing this uh, program up earlier in treatment to first line that's underway. And the last uh, study I want to talk about in advanced disease uh, is this study called the DESTINY study. Now, trastuzumab is a drug that's been mainly used in breast cancer uh, because breast cancers commonly will have what we call overexpression of HER2. HER2 is a, a genetic abnormality that drives cancers. And while it more frequently drives breast than colon cancer, about uh, two to 5% of patients with colon cancer uh, will have tumors that also overexpress uh, this HER2 uh, and therefore provide a potential target. Now, this is what we call an antibody drug conjugate or ADC. Uh, so here is the antibody to uh, HER2, which uh, binds to the surface of cancer cells uh, and can block the effectiveness of this uh, on switch that drives tumors to grow. What's new about this particular drug is that uh, it's sort of what we call a magic bullet and that this plugs into the tumor cell and with it, it carries a payload of chemotherapy. Uh, so this is a way of uh, taking 
chemotherapy and apps actually directing it only to the tumor cells, which are the cells in the patient's body that overexpress this uh, HER2 in uh, some cases. So this was a study that looked at patients that had a high expression of HER2, and those are the only ones I'm going to focus on, uh, these 53 patients. So a relatively small study in this case, uh, but also one that, that's very exciting. Many of these patients had previously been treated uh, with a HER2 antibody. <clears throat> and generally, we would expect those patients to not be likely to be very sensitive to retreatment. But this group of patients turned out to be sensitive. Here you can see that about 45% of patients uh, responded to this uh, magic bullet antibody. And here you see what we call a swimmer's plot. Each line here represents a patient on the study. And what we want, and this line, rep oh, go back. that line represents uh, tumor shrinkage if it's below this line or tumor growth if it's above this line. And the dotted line here represents our definition of a partial response. So you can see that almost all of the patients treated with this antibody uh, conjugated to chemotherapy had some response and many of them had complete responses. An unusual finding on the, in this uh, uh, late line of patients. Here you can see progression-free survival uh, with a median of about 6.9 months, which is very good for this uh, subgroup of patients. And again, an overall survival uh, at a year of about 60%, which is also better than we would expect in a heavily pretreated group of patients. And the side effect uh, profile of this, uh, the, the dark blue bars or the more severe side effects were uh, relatively mild uh, with nausea being the most frequent side effect. So the conclusion here is that uh, this looks like a very promising uh, new uh, drug. There was also a study using this drug presented for gastric cancers, uh, and it also looked promising in gastric cancer patients as well. So what are the key points about uh, the studies I've uh, to talked to you about so far? Pembrolizumab is the preferred first-line treatment for patients with MSI high tumors and advanced disease. Panitumumab plus FIFU is a reasonable regimen for older, sicker patients. Cetuximab plus encarafenib is active for this uh, pesky subgroup of patients with the BRAF 600E mutations. Uh, and then this trastuzumab deruxetin uh, looks like it's very active for patients, uh, the subset of patients, uh, 2 to 5 percent with metastatic colorectal cancer who have HER2 overexpressing tumors. So some, uh, some good news uh, in advanced disease. Now let's turn to earlier stage. So adjuvant therapy means treatment given after surgery, uh, where nowadays sometimes we give neoadjuvant therapy, which is chemotherapy and or radiation given before surgery uh, for patients with uh, cancer that's limited to the organ it started uh, in the colon. So uh, stage two colon cancer is cancer that's confined to the colon and hasn't spread to lymph nodes. Stage three colon cancer is cancer that's confined to the colon but has spread to nearby lymph nodes. Uh, and I've got uh, two studies where I'm going to talk about stages two and three cancer for colon cancer patients, and then three studies where I'm going to talk about treatment for rectal cancer. So the first study uh, is uh, called the IDEA collaboration. And what it looked at was uh, 12,000 patients from four different studies done across the world who were randomly assigned to three months versus six months of chemotherapy after they had their surgery for their initial colon cancer. So this study only applies to colon cancer, not to rectal cancer. And here you can see that the study was actually published already in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is just an update of these studies. And you can see that <clears throat> three months versus six months of chemotherapy uh, was uh, just as good uh, in this study if you looked at all comers. 
Now we also looked at subsets of patients. All right, and I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. Now, why would you want three months versus six months of chemotherapy? Well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, uh, twice as much chemo is twice as much uh, in terms of inconvenience and cost, but also in terms of toxicity. Uh, and since we use oxaliplatin uh, in these uh, studies, and oxaliplatin can cause sensory neuropathy, meaning tingling in the fingers and toes, the more you give of it, the more likely patients are to develop this irritating uh, and sometimes uh, permanent side effect. So you can see, for example, with Fulfox here that those patients who got uh, th three months of therapy only had a 3% incidence of the more severe numbness and tingling versus 16% of those who got uh, six months of therapy. Now, capecitabine is an oral form of 5-FU given with oxaliplatin. And here again, you can see that three months of therapy was better than uh, uh, six months in terms of uh, side effects. And here you can see essentially uh, with longer follow-up that these two curves are entirely overlapping when you group all the patients together. And here you can see that uh, KPOX and Folfox were both effective uh, regimens here. You can also see here though, that for high risk patients, these are patients who have what we call T4 tumors. That means tumors that have invaded into nearby organs uh, besides the colon. If they were given Folfox, they needed six months of therapy. But if they were given KPOX, the uh, pill form of 5-FU, uh, three months of therapy was just as good. So with almost 13,000 patients in this, I, essentially what this study has done is allowed us to treat almost all patients with three months of treatment and has led to us preferring KPOX over Fulfox uh, when we recommend treatments uh, for patients. Uh, and so shortening chemotherapy is certainly a benefit to patients, particularly if you can do it uh, at the expense of fewer side effects and without the expense of uh, outcome. So there's minimal, if any, difference between three and six months in activity, but uh, a large difference in side effects. Uh, and that, that's the key takeaway from this. Uh, since most of the patients with stage three colon cancer are low risk, they should receive three months of KPOX, for the 40% of patients who are at high risk, three months of KPOX uh, is just as good, but if they prefer to get Folfox, they should get six months of therapy. So this was one of the sub-studies that made up the IDEA program, uh, which was conducted uh, by a, a US uh, oncology group called CLGB. And this study looked at the three versus six month uh, question, but also had a secondary randomization uh, to uh, the COX-2 inhibitor celecoxin. Now COX-2 is the same enzyme that's inhibited by aspirin. And there have been randomized studies that have shown that aspirin and COX-2 uh, helps reduce uh, the number of premalignant polyps. Uh, particularly in patients with Lynch syndrome, which is the inherited predisposition to colon cancer. So what this study does is it gave six uh, versus 12 treatments with Folfox, or three months versus six months, and then had a secondary randomization to, to get uh, this drug celecoxib or not. And here you can see that there was no significant difference between the white curve, which is the celecoxib curve, and the placebo curve. There was a minimal difference, but it didn't meet statistical significance. And so this is considered a negative study. And here you can see the overall survival data show the curves pretty much on top of each other. So the conclusion for this study was that the addition of celecoxib to Folfox adjuvant therapy did not significantly improve the disease-free or overall survival. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about rectal cancer, which is a less common cancer, but uh, one that uh, uh, is uh, 
very relevant to many of the patients who would likely call into this uh, webinar. So uh, this is a study looking at a European approach by a European group of investigators. Uh, it's called the RAPIDO study. Uh, and it looks at short course of radiation followed by chemotherapy versus preoperative treatment with uh, chemotherapy. Now, rectal cancer uh, had initially been a, a subset of colorectal cancer that had a much higher local recurrence rate. You can see back in the 1990s that almost 25% of patients would have a local recurrence of their tumors. And what happened over time is we, uh, develop principles of better surgery, what's now called a total mesorectal excision, uh, and also appreciated the value of radiation and chemotherapy uh, at reducing local recurrence rates. And so in 2010, we're down from over 25% to about 5% of patients having a local recurrence. Now 5% is still 5% uh, too many, and we're trying to find better approaches. So in this study design, it was a randomization to standard radiation, which is five and a half weeks of radiation given with chemotherapy, followed by surgery, followed by uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after the surgery, versus the experimental arm, which was just five days of radiation not given with chemo, six months of chemotherapy, and then surgery. So here it was radiation with chemo, surgery, more chemo. Here it was short radiation, chemo, followed by surgery. You can see this was a large study, 920 patients. And that I, the patients did have a difference uh, in uh, neurologic toxicity with uh, more patients getting uh, preoperative therapy, getting uh, the sensory neuropathy, also getting more of them having uh, vascular disorders and more of them having diarrhea. Here you can see that the patients that uh, had a complete uh, resection of their tumors uh, was a, a, about even with the two therapies, but that there was a higher likelihood with the short course radiation and preoperative chemotherapy for patients to have tumors that no longer had cancer in them. And this is an important principle in that uh, we're now questioning whether these patients need to have surgery at all. Uh, and I'll present another study uh, in a few minutes that talks about that. Here you can see that uh, the experimental treatment had a slightly lower likelihood of disease-related treatment failure than the standard therapy, uh, and a lower likelihood of distant metastases. Also, uh, about the same level of uh, local regional failure. And the overall survivals were still the same, although this study is not fully mature yet. So the take-home messages here was that uh, essentially this doubled the pathologic complete remission rate from 14 to 28% with this uh, experimental approach. Now the next study I wanna talk about looks at uh, a stronger chemotherapy regimen, just chemotherapy versus preoperative chemoradiation in patients with rectal cancer. So the background here is that preoperative chemoradiation therapy followed by uh, modern day surgery has been the standard of care since about 2004, but that 25 to 30% of patients still develop metastatic disease. Uh, this uh, three chemo drug regimen uh, known as fulfirinox has a higher response rate in patients with metastatic disease. And so this study attempts to bring that into the adjuvant center. So this used the standard radiation, the longer course radiation, followed by surgery, followed by uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery, versus giving three months of chemotherapy, followed by radiation, then an operation, and then more chemotherapy afterwards. Here you can see that most patients were able to get all of this uh, therapy, that uh, they did have side effects, but the, they weren't, uh, uh, prohibitive, uh, and that uh, in the patients with uh, 
who receive the total neoadjuvant therapy, which they abbreviate as TNT, there was a higher rate of tumor regression uh, to near complete response. Uh, this came at uh, uh, a lower side effect profile actually than the standard approach. The disease-free survival, uh, which again is somewhat immature, looks a little better for the experimental approach of the heavy chemotherapy preoperatively. Uh, this turned out to be safe and uh, is particularly of interest in patients with the locally advanced rectal cancers. The last study I'm going to talk about uh, is called the OPRA study for organ preservation and rectal adenocarcinoma from a group of investigators at uh, Sloan Kettering. Uh, and so uh, this, this study uh, is trying to get patients to a complete response with upfront treatment in hopes that they could actually not have to have their rectum removed. Uh, this is sort of like the principle of giving chemo and radiation and breast cancer to allow patients to have a lumpectomy uh, rather than a mastectomy. So this was a small study and it looked at uh, historical controls of patients that had previously been treated uh, at Sloan Kettering <clears throat> versus patients uh, who got uh, chemo radiation followed by chemotherapy versus those who got chemotherapy followed by uh, chemo radiation before uh, they were looked at to see what their response to therapy was. Uh, those patients who had no clinical response to this therapy went to surgery with this so-called total mesorectal excision, while those who had a clinical response uh, uh, were, were observed uh, and didn't necessarily have uh, surgery unless they had a recurrence. The chemotherapy was Fulfox or Kpox. The radiation was a longer course radiation. Here you see the disease-free survival showing no real difference uh, whether you got chemo first or radiation first uh, in this small study. Uh, no difference in the recurrence rate. Uh, but the patients who got uh, chemo first followed by radiation versus those who got radiation first followed by chemo uh, had a higher uh, likelihood of not having to have surgery. So when it's, this says TMA free, it means uh, patients who, who were followed and never had a recurrence of their rectal cancer. Now, of course, you can do the surgery if they do have a recurrence, if you catch it early. So a treatment plan that includes total neoadjuvant therapy and watchful waiting, which is what WW stands for, uh, resulted in uh, about half of the patients not having to lose their rectums. Uh, there was no difference in disease-free survival, uh, and this needs to be confirmed in a larger study. So their take-home message here was that organ preservation may be a safe alternative but longer follow-up is needed. So my final slide uh, is that colon cancer uh, is not just one disease, uh, but uh, a disease called by a number of mutations, and we're now individualizing treatment uh, based on uh, the genomic abnormalities in an individual's tumor. Uh, three months of adjuvant Kpox is sufficient and less toxic for stage three disease, Chemo RT before surgery is promising and may allow patients uh, with complete remissions to avoid surgery. So I'm going to stop there. I wanted to leave about 15 minutes for questions, and it looks like uh, we're right on schedule. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. That was great. Um, we really, really appreciate that thorough overview of ASCO. So um, just as a reminder to folks listening live, you can go ahead and tap uh, type in any questions that you have, um, and I will see them on the screen and I can ask them on your behalf. Uh, we did have a couple questions already come in. The first one, was there any research of interest looking specifically at early age onset colorectal cancer? So early age onset colorectal cancer is a, a topic that is uh, of increasing interest uh, because uh, as many of you know, uh, the trends for uh, colorectal cancer overall are going down. 
Uh, but the frequency of young people being diagnosed with early age of onset colorectal cancer uh, is actually going up. Uh, there were no specific treatment trials uh, on early age onset colorectal cancer. Uh, there was, uh, there were some studies that looked at the molecular and genetic abnormalities in early stage colorectal cancer, but the findings of those studies are not really applicable to treatment uh, uh, at this point. Uh, I will say that uh, they may translate into treatment advances in the future. Uh, uh, the other thing that I will tell you, and this did not happen at ASCO, but uh, for those patients who have Lynch syndrome, which predisposes to early age onset colorectal cancer, there was just an update on the CAP study, which shows that aspirin can be preventive uh, for individuals uh, with uh, Lynch syndrome. Uh, and this means not only patients who've had colorectal cancer, but their relatives who are at risk for developing colorectal cancer. Uh, and so that is a way of uh, preventing early onset colorectal cancer in a subset of patients. Oh, sorry about that. I couldn't uh, unmute myself. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, is there any data on using pembrolizumab in MSI stable patients? So the answer to that is yes, there is. Uh, and that the data unfortunately don't show activity in patients with uh, microsatellite stable tumors. Uh, there is a new approval that the FDA just made uh, that looks at not just microsatellite instability, but also looks at a, another finding called tumor mutational burden. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that uh, pembrolizumab works in patients with Lynch syndrome or microsatellite high tumors is that the defective spell check that I talked about means that these tumors have many, many mutations. So their tumor mutational burden is high. There is a small subset of MSI stable patients, those the 85% of patients with colorectal cancer, that have a high tumor mutational burden. And so the FDA just approved using pembrolizumab in that subset of patients using a study by Foundation Medicine uh, to establish whether the tumor mutational burden is high. So a small subset of patients with microsatellite stable tumors might fit into that high tumor mutational burden group. Now, there are all kinds of uh, studies being done trying to uh, turn patients with whose tumors have uh, microsatellite stability into responders uh, to pembrolizumab. Uh, and those include such things as CAR T therapy, where uh, tumor cells are taken out of the patient and then uh, immune antibody is generated to try and make uh, the immune system recognize those tumors as foreign, giving that CART therapy with pembrolizumab or uh, nivolumab. Uh, but that's experimental at this time. There also are many other uh, experimental drugs that are being looked at. And so there is hope that in time, we will learn to uncloak tumor cells so that uh, even patients who don't have MSI high tumors can benefit from this immune therapy, but that isn't the case currently. Thank you. Our next question. Um, I understand that most US GI oncologists use full FOX rather than KPOX, which does not show as much benefit with a three month course versus six month. Should patients re be requesting KPOX if their cancer center does not offer it? Well, so uh, virtually every cancer center will offer KPOX uh, and full FOX. Uh, it is uh, often the oncologist's preference about whether to use capecitabine or 5-FU infusion. Uh, and I, I think that many oncologists are going to be switching to KPOX. Uh, I have to say that I had been a, a proponent of full FOX, but am now a proponent of KPOX. 
Uh, so uh, I do think that patients ought to ask their doctor, why am I not getting K-pox and could I get K-pox uh, uh, if they're not getting it? Thank you. Um, great question. And of course, always having that discussion um, with your, with your um, care team is incredibly important. Um, okay, our next question. Um, is there any research that indicates some correlation in HPV and CRC cancers in the young onset category? So that's an interesting question. Uh, HPV is human, human papillomavirus. Uh, and human papillomavirus has been linked to a number of cancers, uh, in particular cervical cancer uh, and head and neck cancer. And I'll just put in a, uh, an endorsement of uh, getting uh, vaccinated to prevent these HPV-associated cancers. Uh, in the oncology world, uh, we don't think of HPV vaccination as a let's have sex uh, in youngsters vaccination. We think of uh, let's prevent cancer in oldsters uh, as the reason for getting the HPV vaccination. To date, there is no evidence that colon cancer is related to uh, HPV. It is interesting, however, that anal cancer, which is not colon cancer, it's a different cancer entirely, but part of the GI tract, is also HPV related and also can be prevented uh, by vaccination uh, with the HPV vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um, Let's see, I have another question that came in specifically about the Beacon trial. Um, what would you say to some of the criticism around this particular trial, the Beacon trial? Well, so I'm not sure of what the particular criticism this individual is uh, thinking about. Uh, the main criticism that I've heard of it is that uh, these two drugs are expensive. Uh, and I, they are being given in a palliative setting, meaning that they're not going to cure anybody, but they can extend patients' lives. And as I mentioned, these uh, tumors with the BRAF600E mutation uh, are particularly uh, refractory to standard chemotherapy. Uh, so I, I actually uh, really like this study. Uh, it was conducted uh, uh, by a, a group led by uh, MD Anderson uh, oncologists who are very uh, adept laboratory investigators that came up with this idea. Uh, so it, it theoretically makes sense and it was nice to see that uh, it, it uh, turned out to be effective in this subset of patients. Uh, I think the study was meticulously, meticulously conducted uh, so I don't have any criticisms about the conduct of the study. Uh, I actually see it as an advance uh, uh, in this situation. Thank you. We just have a couple more questions to get through. Um, and if for those that are that are listening in, please type in your questions. If we don't have time to get to them today, we can certainly address them after after the webinar um, is completed. Um, Dr. Goldberg, if you have uh, if you, if you have um, colorectal cancer and are on watch and wait, are there regimens to help reduce the risk of recurrence? So uh, if you've had uh, an early stage colorectal cancer, such as stage two and stage three colorectal cancer, and have had surgery, uh, and depending on whether you had stage two disease, or generally we don't recommend it, post-operative chemotherapy or stage three disease where you had post-operative chemotherapy. Uh, there are some things that you can do to reduce your uh, risk of recurrence. So there's uh, very convincing data now that exercise uh, is of value uh, in patients with colorectal cancer in reducing the development of precancerous polyps and actually reducing the likelihood of recurrent disease. Uh, and this is a fairly significant amount of exercise. Uh, if you were to uh, do walking, it would be about five hours of uh, vigorous walking a week. Uh, if you're jogging or bicycling, uh, you can get away with less time uh, exercise. 
There also are some data that uh, aspirin may reduce uh, the likelihood of uh, new polyps forming. And people who have had one colorectal cancer have about a 1% risk per year of getting another colon cancer sometime in their lifetime, which is why we continue to do colonoscopies on a regular basis in those patients. The third thing is getting your colonoscopies done. Uh, colonoscopies can allow removal of premalignant polyps. They also can diagnose uh, recurrences uh, at the site of the uh, place where the colon was reattached, uh, what we call an anastomotic recurrence. Uh, so that's another thing that uh, can be done. Uh, the, the fourth thing I would suggest is that uh, there are data that the Mediterranean style diet, which is high in uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, and uh, uh, seafood uh, and lower in animal fats uh, is associated with a, a lower risk of colon cancer. Uh, so those are the things that I know of to do there. Other than aspirin, there's no drug that I would recommend uh, in this setting. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, is there any promising research uh, specifically for KRAS mutated uh, stage four colorectal cancer? Uh, so uh, there are lots of studies being done looking at combinations of targeted agents, uh, similar to the Beacon study that I discussed, uh, that are being done for patients who have uh, KRAS mutations in their tumors. The reason that this is important is that we know that uh, two of the drugs that we commonly use for advanced colorectal cancer, panitumumab and cetuximab, which target the epidermal growth factor receptor, are not effective in patients with KRAS uh, mutated tumors. And so they have fewer options than other uh, uh, patients do. Uh, so there is lots of interest uh, in experimental drugs uh, targeting this pathway. Uh, but none of the studies yet are ready for prime time. Uh, if this is somebody who has that uh, kind of tumor in advanced disease, uh, it would be worthwhile to uh, go to uh, uh, your doctor and ask about uh, research that's available either at the center where you're being treated or uh, at other nearby centers. And you also can go to clinicaltrials.gov and uh, potentially find uh, clinical trials uh, for that subset of patients uh, there as well. Uh, fight, of course, fight colorectal cancer uh, also has a clinical trial uh, finding app that can be helpful to you. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. And thank you so much, everyone, for all your great questions um, and engagement uh, this morning in today's webinar. Um, that's it for today. Um, again, Dr. Goldberg, really appreciate your time and your dedication to this work. I'm happy to be a participant, and I hope you learned something. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.